dawn breaks over the giants of Easter Island. This is the most mysterious place on Earth, adrift in the Pacific two and a half thousand miles from the coast of South America. For 250 years, these huge stone statues have challenged explorers. Who are these giants? Where did they come from? Some weigh 80 tons. Was this how they were moved? Why did the statue builders suddenly down tools and abandon their work forever? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communications satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. There can hardly be a place on Earth that's been as extensively studied as Easter Island. Archaeologists have sketched, measured, and mapped more than 19,000 sites. But they had to jostle for space with anthropologists, agriculturalists, historians, seismologists, and plane loads of other experts, not to mention TV crews. But no one can hope to answer the central riddle of this mysterious island. No written history from the Age of Giants has ever been found, so we'll never know the purpose of these extraordinary sculptures. The statues on their rock platforms are called Moai by the islanders, the Rapa Nui people. No one knows why they were built in their hundreds across the island, but 250 years of investigation have prized some of their secrets from them. Some wear headgear, some are half buried, some look to the heavens, some stand in groups. For anthropologist Joanne van Tilburg, this is a place of pilgrimage. The giants were hewn from the rock of the Rano Raraku volcano. It's one of the wonders of the mysterious world. This amazing place is the place of creation. This is the quarry on Easter Island, Rano Iraku, where nearly all of the statues on the island were made. The Rapa Nui people made these statues using a Stone Age technology. They used stone tools and hacked into the stone with those stone tools in a prescribed manner so that it was very clear what each individual was doing. It was a real, very well organized work effort. They first sort of hacked out, cut out a rectangular block shaped it slightly, and then undercut it, moved it out, and began to finish some of the details later. The Rapa Nui people believe the Moai are the living face of their ancestors. I think that these, these Moai represent family units and the effort of family units to move forward, to, to get a position in their culture, to push themselves upward with, with this huge status symbol that they, that they carved and moved. The longer I work here, the less I know. That much I'm certain about. Um, the more answers I think I've got, the more questions develop. It just seems to me like this is a place of never-ending, enigmatic thinking. This is a place of, it's been called a place of mystery at Edith's. Um, I think there are questions we will never know how to form. There are answers we will never be able to get out of these silent sentinels. Freed from their volcanic bedrock, the statues went from here to every part of the island. The ancient track from the quarry at Rano Raraku was known as the Sacred Way. What's not known is just how the giants travelled along it. There are statues in the parks and streets near my home in Colombo. Most of them are much smaller than the Easter Island giants, yet erecting them was far from easy. Not long ago, the government restored a huge statue which had fallen down centuries before. Even with modern technologies, it proves to be what one newspaper called a feat that even engineers shudder to touch. So how on earth 
did the Easter Islanders transport and raise their giants. Even the most modern Japanese crane and mechanical diggers find raising the moai tough going. In 1934, this French and Belgian expedition had no such technology. They made off with their moai the hard way. It took a hundred islanders and all the ship's crew to drag a six-ton statue by sledge. Only after a struggle did they winch it on board for show in a Belgian museum. Prague, capital of the Czech Republic. Home of a man who devotes every waking moment to shifting heavy objects. Pavel Pavel moves heavy plant for a living and for fun. The problems of moving the moai had Pavel hooked. A giant was cast in concrete, the manpower roped in, and a legend was put to the test. It said the giants had walked. Pavel showed this could happen by rocking his giant from side to side. Today, he's testing different claims. First, that the moai were dragged on their backs over rollers. The workers of Prague are enlisted and put into harness. It only takes 20 strong men to get nine tons of moai a rolling. <coughs> The support team's hard pressed to keep up with the rollers. <coughs> oh! <laughs> uh, this method was probably used for small statues. It means between 5 okay, and uh, 10, 15, maybe 20 tons on this train. Uh, now I would like to try experiment to pull statue only on grass without rolls. With all nothing, only on sledge and on grass. I will need more people. In every case, maybe three times more people. Even with three times the manpower. Without rollers to help it, the moai won't budge an inch. The experiment wasn't successful, but I am satisfied because we can see that this way is nonsense. Uh, now we can uh, try with mashed potatoes. We will put many potatoes under sledge and we will see. Uh, people on Easter Island believe that uh, this is solution and that uh, sledge with statue was pulled on layer from potato smash. It's legend only. Legend speaks of Easter Islanders pulling their statues on yams. The sweet potatoes found everywhere in the Pacific, but nowhere in Prague. For Pavel, ordinary potatoes must do. Legend, maybe true legend, is true that uh, potatoes helped for lubrication. In America's cowboy country, Professor Charlie Love also has moving on his mind. Like Pavel Pavel, he's cast himself a moai. Charlie Love wanted to try out the walking theory as well, but with wooden feet on the statue, rollers under it, and a posse of choreographed cowboys. On local TV news, Charlie has pulling power. On three, one, two, that's it, pull. Now here's something you don't see every day, a 13-foot high, 17,600-pound moai. 
Carter's not quite making it. But the 25 Rock Springs volunteers couldn't budge this moai from the soft good, dirt. Good. It's good. Keep going. Hunter. Getting the giant to move can need a little 20th century help. Oh, 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 oh. Watch your back, back out, out of the way, out of the way. Ah, wrap. Uh oh. The single greatest problem that we had in any of the moving methods was choreography, and I think perhaps that if you belonged to the lineage that this statue was going to pertain to, you might have better chances at uh, choreographing the moving of it than if you're in Rock Springs, Wyoming, with a bunch of Americans. Because getting them together, explaining exactly what you're going to do, and then having them do it in unison and not be catastrophic about it, meaning pulling the statue over or having it fall on someone, uh, that, that takes a lot of coordination. We were eventually able to move the statue in terms of, of how far can you move it and how fast can you move it. We moved our statue on a level, level ground about 132 feet in the space of two minutes. What you're probably looking at on Easter Island is a lesson in how people can get together to do spectacular things and cooperate at a, at a huge level. I mean, it must have taken hundreds of people, all neatly coordinated, to move some of those big ones. I think there are loads of mysteries left on Easter Island. I think the biggest one, the most pressing one currently, is you, you've noticed, you've been staring at the statue, it has no top knot on it. How did they get the top knots on the top of the statues? No one knows what the top knots or pukao were for. Whether they were crowns, turbans, or hairstyles, only a few giants wore them. Those that did became even more awesome. Made of red volcanic rock called scoria, the top knots weighed as much as 11 tons. Hey! Hey! Oh. hey. Mounting them on the giants is a heavyweight problem, even for Pavel Pavel. His first task is to overcome the top knot's resistance. Luckily, he knows his potatoes. The mash should ease things. Pavel uses only ropes, tree trunks, manpower, and ingenuity, all that the Easter Islanders had. Finally, the Prague Pukau is safely in place. Back on Easter Island, wild horses won't drag one secret from the Moai. What power did the giants possess to make people haul them up to 14 miles over rocky terrain? It's puzzled every adventurer. From the Dutchman, Admiral Jacob Roggeveen, who discovered the island on Easter Day in 1722, to Captain James Cook in 1774. He wondered if the statues showed that a race of giants had actually lived here. The Frenchman La Perouse didn't think the giants were religious idols, but noted that the natives showed the statues respect. During the First World War, Catherine Scoresby Routledge catalogued every single Moai. She unearthed no answers. French academic Alfred Metro sought the truth in the island's legends. In the 1940s, Tor Heyerdahl thought that the giant builders came from South America. He retraced their journey on his Contiki raft. The giants themselves maintain a stony silence. They stand, most of them with their backs to the sea, watching over the communities whose ancestors some say they represent. But there are a few exceptions. These stand inland, set askew on their rock platforms. For astronomer William Liller, these moai provide some clues. We found that there were 
approximately 14 that were aligned with the equinoxes, with the solstices, those special points where the sun rises on the first day of the winter, the first day of spring. And it was unusual to find so many. It's not what you would expect. The chances of it happening by, by accident were, were, were exceedingly slim. So therefore, there must have been some reason behind it. And the obvious answer was they did it to show the direction towards the rising sun on these very special dates, the shortest day of the year, etc. To them, the stars, the heavens, the sun, the moon, these were the closest other pieces of land that they knew. They were able to tell where the sun would rise. They were able to tell where the moon would rise, the motions of the stars. And they wanted to memorialize these in stone by building platforms and building moai that would look in these very special directions. We found that uh, this particular platform and this particular moai, the, the statue, uh, had been twisted around uh, relative to this plaza out in front so that it was looking off in that direction. And it turns out, we found, that that is precisely the direction in which the sun rises on the shortest day of the year. 21st of June down here. And at the same time, it rises uh, just, just to the right of a small little hill over there called um, Mata Maengo. And uh, it was very probably, we believe, made to mark that particular special direction in the sky. Lilla believes Moai like this were also farming calendars. The uh, islanders that lived in the inner parts of the island were those were the crop growers, and they had to know when, when the time was ripe for planting the crops. And so by noting when the sun rose on the shortest day of the year, they knew that then shortly afterwards uh, it was going to start to get warm and they should have their, their crops planted. In 1978, a chance discovery was made here at Anakena. It opened the eyes of the archaeologists and the statues. An Easter Islander found two strange objects. In a flash of insight, she put one and one together. She found the components of an eye made of coral and red scoria, something that was placed inside the socket of the statue. This coral portion was first found. And we found, or other archaeologists have found these things on several other sites on the island. And people usually thought they were ceremonial bowls or some sort of an artifact like that. But with the magic that comes with finding um, objects on the same site, but not understood in terms of how they relate, it was made clear that these two pieces went together. And this eye suddenly opened up a whole range of possibilities and opportunities for better understanding the statues. Coral and red scoria is found often in association with crematoria and with burials. So we believe they're sacred materials associated with funeral ceremonies. When these eyes were in the statues, some of those kinds of ceremonies must have been going on. Hundreds of statues lie unfinished in and around the quarry where they were carved. It looks as though the sculptors had just put down their tools for a tea break. But what really brought this extraordinary undertaking to an end? We can only speculate. However they moved the giants, the islanders needed trees. But today, Easter Island is desolate. There's barely a branch to be seen. <laughs> With the help of the Chilean Navy, Agronomist Gerardo Velasco is looking for Easter Island's lost forests. He believes traces may lie deep in the lake at the heart of this crater. Under the water deep in this mud lie layer upon layer of sediments. Preserved in them are pollens from thousands of years ago. They hold the key to tell experts what vegetation grew on the island and when. 
These sediments are the leaves of a book waiting to be read. The harvest of today's exploratory probe will be flown across the Pacific to New Zealand and Professor John Flenley. What I do is to open up the core and take out from a particular depth a piece as a sample about one cubic centimetre. It will end up on a microscope slide and then we can look at that under the microscope and see what we've got in the way of pollen. Okay, let's have a look what we've got. We found stacks of pollen and mostly of one particular species, a kind of palm. It seems to be now extinct, but it was very similar to the Chilean wine palm, a big tree, and it uh, became extinct only during the last 2,000 years, during which people arrived on the island. The island had formerly been forested. We know it is now completely without trees, and perhaps the removal of the trees was the thing which had triggered the collapse of the civilization. When the trees had been cut down, there were no more rollers, and people couldn't move statues without rollers. Therefore, there was no point in continuing to make them. On a fishing trip to these remote cliffs, Gerardo Velasco netted another clue. He suddenly noticed neat cylindrical holes, all that was left of palm trees swept away and entombed by flowing lava. I started to look around and found several holes of uh, remarkable features resembling the typical a palm trunk and at that moment I was, uh, was so excited because uh, it fitted exactly what had been found in the in the bulk, in the craters pollen samples pollen cores uh, made the whole picture quite clear that they were definitely trunks to my view they are straight very very regular unlike the gas uh, tubes and caves that we are so familiar with in this island. They're absolutely regular, and if you look inside, you can even see the imprints of the leaves of the palm. Eventually, when the moais were uh, carved and they had to be rolled, probably many of these trees had to be cut down to make the rollers. They provide excellent rollers. These trunks, they're perfectly cylindrical. When they had no rollers, of course, they couldn't move them anymore. They couldn't move the moais anymore. So we believe. Or could the moai themselves literally point to the reason for the end of the giant building age? All around the island they lie, face down or up, toppled from their rock platforms. Historians thought they were demolished by warring tribes. But one geologist realized that Easter Island lies at the heart of one of the world's most active earthquake zones. He found that 80% had fallen in the same direction, to the west, knocked over, he believes, by seismic waves. Easter Island is clear in the middle of a very active earthquake region, yeah? This is mean to me is uh, the propagation of seismic way in one direction from the west of the island. And you found 80% uh, of uh, uh, Moai in, fall down in that direction. Professor Ferran concludes the statue builders tried to fight the Earth's upheavals. From building huge Moai on small platforms, they moved to smaller statues on bigger and bigger bases. But in the end, they were forced to give up. But still, uh, the Moai continue to go down, uh, fall down. They maybe think, God don't like our work. It was not the problem of three at top of the Moai. It was earthquake. I find the idea that the statue builders gave up because earthquakes kept undoing their work, very plausible. 
It's a natural human reaction. And as for the theory that the islanders brought down their civilization by damaging their environment, it shows that we don't have a monopoly on ecological disasters. So perhaps there's a lesson here for all of us in the mysterious fate of Easter Island.